Lecture 20 Instructions to Converts Continued Feed My Lambs John 21.15 I propose to continue the subject by 1. Noticing several other points upon which young converts ought to be instructed 2. Showing the manner in which young converts should be treated by the church 3. Mentioning some of the evils which naturally result from defective instructions given in that stage of Christian experience. 1. Further instructions to young converts. 1. It is of great importance that young converts should early be made to understand what religion consists in. Perhaps you will be surprised at my mentioning this. What? Are they converts and do not know what religion consists in? I answer, they would know if they had had no instruction but such as was drawn from the Bible. But multitudes of people have imbibed such notions about religion that not only young converts but a great part of the church members do not know what religion consists in so as to have a clear and distinct idea of it. There are many ministers who do not. I do not mean to say that they have no religion, for it may be charitably believed they have, but what I mean is that they cannot give a correct statement of what does and what does not constitute real religion. It is important that young converts should be taught negatively what religion does not consist in. A. Not in doctrinal knowledge. Knowledge is essential to religion, but it is not religion. The devil has doctrinal knowledge, but he has no religion. A man may have doctrinal knowledge to any extent without a particle of religion. Yet some people have very strange ideas on the subject, as though an increase of doctrinal knowledge indicated an increase of piety. In a certain instance, when some young converts had made rapid progress in doctrinal knowledge, a person who saw it remarked, How these young converts grow in grace! Here he confounded improvement in knowledge with improvement in piety. The truth was that he had no means of judging of their growth in grace and it was no evidence of it because they were making progress in doctrinal knowledge. b. They should be taught that religion is not a substance. It is not any root or sprout or seed or anything else in the mind as a part of the mind itself. Persons often speak of religion as if it were something which is covered up in the mind, just as a spark of fire may be covered up in the ashes, which does not show itself, and which produces no effects, but yet lives, and is ready to act as soon as it is uncovered. And, in like manner, they think they may have religion as something remaining in them, although they do not manifest it by obeying God but they should be taught that this is not of the nature of religion. It is not part of the mind itself, nor of the body, nor is it a root or seed or spark that can exist and yet be hid and produce no effects. C. Teach them that religion does not consist in raptures or ecstasies or high flights of feeling. There may be a great deal of these where there is religion, but it ought to be understood that they are all involuntary emotions and may exist in full power where there is no religion. They may be the mere workings of the imagination without any true religious affection at all. Persons may have them to such a degree as actually to swoon away with ecstasy even on the subject of religion without having any religion. I have known a person almost carried away with rapture by a mere view of the natural attributes of God, His power and wisdom as displayed in the starry heavens and yet the person had no religion. Religion is obedience to God, the voluntary submission of the soul to his will. D. Neither does religion consist in going to services, or reading the Bible, or praying, or any other of what are commonly called religious duties. The very phrase religious duties ought to be struck out of the vocabulary of young converts. They should be made to know that these acts are not religion. Many become very strict in performing certain things which they call religious duties and suppose that is being religious 
while they are careless about the ordinary duties of life, which in fact constitute a life of piety. Prayer may be an expression and an act of piety, or it may not be. Going to church or to a prayer meeting may be considered either as a means, an act, or an expression of pious sentiment. But the performance of these does not constitute a man a Christian, and there may be a great strictness and zeal in these without a particle of religion. If young converts are not taught to discriminate, they may be led to think there is something peculiar in what are called religious duties, and to imagine they have a great deal of religion because they are bound in certain actions that are commonly called religious duties, although they may at the same time be very deficient in honesty or faithfulness or punctuality or temperance or any other of what they choose to call their common duties. They may be very punctilious in some things, may pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, Matthew 23:23, and yet neglect the weightier matters of the law, justice and the love of God. E. Religion does not consist in desires to do good actions. Desires that do not result in choice and action are not virtuous, nor are such desires necessarily vicious. They may arise involuntarily in the mind in view of certain objects, but while they produce no voluntary act, they are no more virtuous or vicious than the beating of the pulse, except in cases where we have indirectly willed them into existence by voluntarily putting ourselves under circumstances calculated to excite them. The wickedest man on earth may have strong desires after holiness. Did you ever think of that? He may see clearly that holiness is the only and indispensable means of happiness and the moment he apprehends holiness as a means of happiness, he naturally desires it. It is to be feared that multitudes are deceiving themselves with the supposition that a desire for holiness as a means of happiness is religion. Many doubtless give themselves great credit for desires that never result in choosing right. They feel desires to do their duty, but do not choose to do it because upon the whole they have still stronger desires not to do it. In such desires there is no virtue. An action or desire to be virtuous in the sight of God must be an act of the will. People often talk most absurdly on this subject, as though their desires had anything good, while they remain mere desires. I think I desire to do so and so, but do you do it? Oh no, but I often feel a desire to do it. This is practical atheism. Whatever desires a person may have, if they are not carried out into actual choice and action, they are not virtuous. And no degree of desire itself is virtuous. If this idea could be made prominent and fully riveted in the minds of men, it would probably annihilate the hopes of half the members of the churches who are living on their good desires while doing nothing for God. F. They should be made to understand that nothing which is selfish is religion. Whatever desires they may have, and whatever choices and actions they may put forth, if after all the reason of them is selfish, there is no religion in them. A man may just as much commit sin in praying, or reading the Bible, or going to a religious service, as in anything else if his motive is selfish. Suppose a man prays simply with a view to promote his own happiness. Is that religion? What is it but attempting to make God his almighty servant? It is nothing else but to attempt a great speculation and to put the universe, God and all, under contribution to make him happy. It is the sublime degree of wickedness. It is so far from being piety that it is in fact superlative wickedness. G. Nothing is acceptable to God as religion unless it is performed heartily to please God. No outward action has anything good or anything that God approves unless it is performed from right motives and from the heart. Young converts should be taught fully and positively that all religion consists in obeying God from the heart. All religion consists in voluntary action. 
all that is holy, all that is lovely in the sight of God, all that is properly called religion, consists in voluntary action, in voluntarily obeying the will of God from the heart. 2. Young converts should be taught that the duty of self-denial is one of the leading features of the gospel. They should understand that they are not pious at all any further than they are willing to take up their cross daily and deny themselves for Christ. There is but little self-denial in the church and the reason is that the duty is so much lost sight of in giving instruction to young converts. How seldom are they told that self-denial is the leading feature in Christianity in pleading for benevolent objects how often will you find that ministers and agents do not even ask Christians to deny themselves for the sake of promoting the object? They only ask them to give what they can spare as well as not. In other words, to offer unto the Lord that which costs them nothing. What an abomination! They only ask for the surplus, for what is not wanted, for what can just as well be given as not. There is no religion in this kind of giving. A man might give a very large sum to a benevolent object and there would be no religion in his doing so if he could give the money as well as not nor would there be any self-denial in it. Jesus Christ exercised self-denial to save sinners. So has God the Father exercised self-denial in giving his Son to die for us and in sparing us and in bearing with our perverseness. The Holy Ghost exercises self-denial in condescending to strive with such unholy beings to bring them to God. The angels exercise self-denial in watching over this world. The apostles planted the Christian religion among the nations by the exercise of self-denial. Are we to think of being religious without any self-denial? Are we to call ourselves Christians, the followers of Christ, the temples of the Holy Ghost? 1 Corinthians 6.19 and to claim fellowship with the apostles when we have never deprived ourselves of anything that would promote our personal enjoyment for the sake of Christ's kingdom young converts should be made to see that unless they are willing to lay themselves out for God and ready to sacrifice life and everything else for Christ they have not the spirit of Christ and are none of his Romans 8, 9. 3. They must be taught what sanctification is. What, you will say? Do not all who are Christians know what sanctification is? No, many do not. Multitudes would be as much at a loss to tell intelligibly what sanctification is as they would be to tell what religion is. If the question were asked of every professor of religion in this city, what is sanctification? I doubt if one in ten would give a right answer. They would blunder just as they do when they undertake to tell what religion is and speak of it as something dormant in the soul, something that is put in and lies there, something that may be practiced or not and still be in them. So they speak of sanctification as if it were a sort of washing off of some defilement or a purging out of some physical impurity or they will speak of it as if the faculties were steeped in sin and sanctification is taking out the stains. This is the reason why some people will pray for sanctification and practice sin, evidently supposing the sanctification is something that precedes obedience. They should be taught that sanctification is not something that precedes obedience, some change in the nature or the constitution of the soul, but sanctification is obedience and as a progressive thing consists in obeying God more and more perfectly. 4. Young converts should be taught so as to understand what perseverance is. It is astonishing how people talk about perseverance as if the doctrine of perseverance is once in grace, always in grace or once converted, sure to go to heaven. This is not the idea of perseverance. The true idea is that if a man is truly converted he will continue to obey God and as a consequence he will surely go to heaven. But if a person gets the idea that because he is converted therefore he will assuredly go to heaven 
that man will almost assuredly go to hell. 5. Young converts should be taught to be religious in everything. They should aim to be religious in every department of life and in all that they do. If they do not aim at this, they should understand that they have no religion at all. If they do not intend and aim to keep all the commandments of God, what pretense can they make to piety? Whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. James 2.10 He is justly subject to the whole penalty. If he disobeys God habitually in one particular, he does not in fact obey him in any particular. Obedience to God consists in the state of the heart. It is being willing to obey God, willing that God should rule in all things. But if a man habitually disobeys God in any one particular, he is in a state of mind that renders obedience in anything else impossible. To say that in some things a man obeys God out of respect to his authority and that in some things he refuses obedience is absurd. The fact is that obedience to God consists in an obedient state of heart, a preference of God's authority and commandments to everything else. If, therefore, an individual appears to obey in some things, and yet perseveringly and knowingly disobeys in any one thing, he is deceived. He offends in one point, and this proves that he is guilty of all. In other words, that he does not, from the heart, obey at all. A man may pray half of his time and have no religion. If he does not keep the commandments of God, his very prayer will be hateful to God. He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. Proverbs 28, 9 Do you hear that? If a man refuses to obey God's law, if he refuses to comply with any one duty, he cannot pray, he has no religion. His very devotions are hateful. 6. Young converts by proper instructions are easily brought to be temperate in all things. 1 Corinthians 9.25 Yet this is a subject greatly neglected in regard to young converts and almost lost sight of in the churches. There is a vast deal of intemperance in the churches. I do not mean intemperate drinking in particular but intemperance in eating and in living generally. There is in fact but little conscience about it in the churches and therefore the progress of reform in the matter is so slow. Nothing but an enlightened conscience can carry forward a permanent reform. Ten years ago most ministers used ardent spirit and kept it in their houses to treat their friends and their ministering brethren with and the great body of the members in the churches did the same. Now there are but few of either who are not actual drunkards that will do so. But still there are many that indulge without scruple in the use of wine. Chewing and smoking tobacco too are acts of intemperance. If they use these mere stimulants when there is no necessity for them, what is that but intemperance? That is not being temperate in all things. Until Christians have a conscience on this subject and be made to feel that they have no right to be intemperate in anything, they will make but little progress in religion. It is well known, or ought to be, that tea and coffee have no nutrients in them. They are mere stimulants. They go through the system without being digested. The milk and sugar you put in them are nourishing, and so they would be just as much so if you mix them with rum and made milk punch but the tea and coffee afford no nourishment and yet I dare say that a majority of the families in this city give more in a year for their tea and coffee than they do to save the world from hell probably this is true respecting entire churches even agents of benevolent societies will dare to go through the churches soliciting funds for the support of missionary and other institutions and yet use tea, coffee, and in some cases tobacco. Strange, no doubt many are giving five times as much for mere intemperance as they give for every effort to save the world. If professing Christians could be made to realize how much they spend for what are mere poisons and nothing else, they would be amazed. 
many persons will strenuously maintain that they cannot get along without these stimulants, these poisons, and they cannot give them up. No, not to redeem the world from eternal damnation. And very often they will absolutely show anger if urged with, just as soon as the argument begins to pinch their consciences. Oh, how long shall the church show her hypocritical face at the missionary meeting and pray God to save the world while she is actually throwing away five times as much for sheer intemperance as she will give to save the world? Some of you may think these are little things and that it is quite beneath the dignity of the pulpit to lecture against tea and coffee. But I tell you it is a great mistake of yours if you think these are little things when they make the church odious in the sight of God by exposing her hypocrisy and lust. Here is an individual who pretends he has given himself up to serve Jesus Christ and yet he refuses to deny himself any darling lust and then he will go and pray O Lord save the world O Lord thy kingdom come I tell you it is hypocrisy Shall such prayers be heard? Unless men are willing to deny themselves, I would not give a groat for the prayers of as many such professors as would cover the whole of the United States. These things must be taught to young converts. It must come to this point in the church that men shall not be called Christians unless they will cut off the right hand and pluck out the right eye and deny themselves for Christ's sake. A little thing? See it poison the spirit of prayer. See it debase and sensualize the soul. Is that a trifle beneath the dignity of the pulpit when these intemperate indulgences of one kind and another cost the church five times if not fifty times more than all she gives for the salvation of the world? An estimate has recently been made showing that in the United States seven millions of dollars worth of coffee is consumed yearly and who does not know that a great part of this is consumed by the church and yet grave ministers and members of Christian churches are not ashamed to be seen countenancing this enormous waste of money while at the same time the poor heathens are sending upon every wind of heaven their agonizing wail for help heaven calls from above go preach the gospel to every creature Mark 16.15 Hell groans from beneath and ten thousand voices cry out from heaven Earth and hell do something to save the world do it oh now or millions more are in hell through your neglect and oh tell it not in Gath the church the ministry will not deny even their lusts to save a world is this Christianity what business have you to use Christ's money for such a purpose are you a steward? Who gave you this liberty? Look to it, lest it should be found at last that you have preferred self-gratification to obedience and made a god of your belly. Philippians 3.19 The time to teach these things with effect is when converts are young. If converts are not properly taught them, if they get a wrong habit and begin with an easy, self-indulgent mode of living, it rarely happens that they become thoroughly reformed. I have conversed with old professors on these subjects and have been astonished at their pertinacious obstinacy in indulging their lusts and I am satisfied that the church never can rise out of this sloth until young converts are faithfully taught at the outset of their religious course to be temperate in all things. 7. They should be taught to have just as much religion in all their business as they have in prayer or in going to a religious service. They should be just as holy, just as watchful, aim just as singly at the glory of God, be just as sincere and solemn in all their daily employments as when they come to the throne of grace. If they are not, their Sabbath performances will be an abomination. 8. They should be taught that it is necessary for them to be just as holy as they think ministers ought to be. There has for a long time been an idea that ministers are bound to be holy and practice self-denial, and so they are. But it is strange they should suppose that ministers are bound to be any more holy than other people. They would be shocked to see a minister showing levity, or running after the fashions, or getting out of temper, or living in a fine house, 
or riding in a coach. Oh, that is dreadful. It does not look well in a minister. Indeed, for a minister's wife to wear such a fine bonnet or such a silk shawl. Oh no, it will never do. But they think nothing of these things in a layman or a layman's wife. That is no offence at all. I am not saying that these things do look well in a minister. I know they do not. But they look in God's eyes just as well in a minister as they do in a layman. You have no more right to indulge in vanity and folly and pride than a minister. Can you go to heaven without being sanctified? Can you be holy without living for God and doing all that you do to his glory? I have heard professedly good men speak against ministers having large salaries and living in an expensive style when they themselves were actually spending a great deal more money for the support of their families than any minister. What would be thought of a minister living in the style in which many professors of religion and elders of churches are living in this city? Why, everybody would say they were hypocrites. But it is just as much an evidence of hypocrisy in a layman to spend God's money to gratify his lusts or to please the world or his family as it is for a minister to do so. It is distressing to hear some of our foremost laymen talk of its being dishonorable to religion to give ministers a large salary and let them live in an expensive style when it is a fact that their own expenses are for the number of their families and the company they have to receive far above those of almost any minister. All this arises out of fundamentally wrong notions imbibed while they were young converts. Young converts have been taught to expect that ministers will have all the religion, especially all the self-denial. So long as this continues, there can be no hope that the church will ever do much for the glory of God or for the conversion of the world. There is nothing of all this in the Bible. Where has God said, you ministers, love God with all your hearts and mind and strength? Or, you ministers, do all to the glory of God. No, these things are said to all alike, and he who attempts to excuse himself from any duty or self-denial, from any watchfulness or sobriety, by putting it off upon ministers, or who ventures to adopt a lower scale of holy living for himself, than he thinks is proper for a minister, is in great danger of proving himself a hypocrite and paying in hell the forfeit of his foolishness. Much depends on the instructions given to young converts if they once get into the habit of supposing that they may indulge in things which they would condemn in a minister. It is extremely unlikely that they will ever get out of it. 9. They should aim at being perfect. Every young convert should be taught that if it is not his purpose to live without sin, he has not yet begun to be religious. What is religion but a supreme love to God and a supreme purpose of heart or disposition to obey God? If there is not this, there is no religion at all. It is one thing to profess to be perfect and another thing to profess and feel you ought to be perfect. It is one thing to say men ought to be perfect and can be if they are so disposed and another thing to say that they are perfect. If any are prepared to say that they are perfect all I have to say is let them prove it. If they are so I hope they will show it by their actions otherwise we can never believe they are perfect. But it is the duty of all to be perfect and to purpose entire, perpetual and universal obedience to God. It should be their constant purpose to live wholly to God and obey all his commandments. They should live so that if they should sin, it would be an inconsistency, an exception, an individual case in which they act contrary to the fixed and general purpose and tenor of their lives. They ought not to sin at all. They are bound to be as holy as God is and young converts should be taught to set out in the right course, or they will never be right. 10. They should be taught to exhibit their light. If the young convert does not exhibit his light and hold it up to the world, it will go out. If he does not bestir himself and go forth and try to enlighten those around him, his light will go out. 
and his own soul will soon be in darkness. Sometimes young converts seem disposed to sit still and not do anything in public till they get a great deal of light or a great deal of religion. But this is not the way. Let the convert use what he has. Let him hold up his little twinkling rushlight, bold and honestly, and then God will make it like a blazing torch. But God will not take the trouble to keep a light burning that is hid. Why should he? Where is the use? This is the reason why so many people have so little enjoyment in religion. They do not exert themselves to honor God. They keep what little they do enjoy so entirely to themselves that there is no good reason why God should bestow blessings and benefits on them. 11. They should be taught how to win souls to Christ. Young converts should be taught particularly what to do to accomplish this and how to do it and then taught to live for this end as the great leading object of life. How strange has been the course sometimes pursued. These persons have been converted, and they are. They get into the church, and then they are left to go along just as they did before. They do nothing, and are taught to do nothing for Christ. And the only change is that they go more regularly to church on the Sabbath, and let the minister feed them as it is called. But suppose he does feed them, they do not grow strong, for they cannot digest it, because they take no exercise, they become spiritual dyspeptics. Now the great object for which Christians are converted and left in this world is, to pull sinners out of the fire, if they do not effect this, they had better be dead. And young converts should be taught this as soon as they are born into the kingdom. The first thing they do should be to go to work for this end, to save sinners. 2. How the church should treat young converts 1. Old professors ought to be able to give young converts a great deal of instruction and they ought to give it. The truth is, however, that the great body of professors in the churches do not know how to give good instruction to young converts and if they attempt to do so, they give only that which is false. The church ought to be able to teach her children, and when she receives them, she ought to be as busy in training them to act as mothers are in teaching their little children such things as they will need to know and do hereafter. But this is far enough from being the case generally, and we can never expect to see young converts habitually taking hold of duty, and going straight forward without declension and backsliding until the time comes when all young converts are intelligently trained by the church. 2. Young converts should not be kept back behind the rest of the church. How often it is found that the old professors will keep the young converts back behind the rest of the church and prevent them from taking any active part in religion for fear they should become spiritually proud. Young converts in such churches are rarely or never called on to take a part in meetings or set to any active duty or the like for fear they should become lifted up with spiritual pride. Thus the church becomes the modest keeper of their humility and teaches them to file in behind the old, stiff, dry, cold members and elders for fear that if they should be allowed to do anything for Christ it will make them proud Whereas the very way to make young converts humble and keep them so is to put them to the work and keep them there. That is the way to keep God with them. And as long as God is with them, he will take care of their humility. Keep them constantly engaged in religion and then the Spirit of God will dwell in them and so they will be kept humble by the most effectual process. But if young converts are left to fall in behind the old professors, where they can never do anything, they will never know what spirit they are of, and this is the very way to run them into the danger of falling into the worst species of spiritual pride. 3. They should be watched over by the church and warned of their dangers, just as a tender mother watches over her young children. Young converts do not know at all the dangers by which they are surrounded the devices of the devil, the temptations of the world, the power of their own passions and habits, and the thousand forms of danger they do not know, and if not properly watched and warned, 
they will run right into such dangers. The church should watch over and care for her young children, just as mothers watch their little children in this great city, lest the carts run over them, or they stray away, or as they watch over them while growing up for fear they may be drawn into the whirlpools of iniquity. The church should watch over all the interests of her young members, know where they are and what are their habits, temptations, dangers, privileges, the state of religion in their hearts and their spirit of prayer. Look at that anxious mother when she sees paleness gather round the brow of her little child. What is the matter with you, my child? Have you eaten something improper? Have you taken cold? What ails you? Oh, how different it is with the children of the church, the lambs that the Saviour has committed to the care of his church. Alas, instead of restraining her children and taking care of them, the church lets them go anywhere and look out for themselves. What should we say of a mother who should knowingly let her children totter along to the edge of a precipice? Should we not say she was horribly guilty for doing so, and that if the child should fall and be killed, its blood would rest on the mother's head. What then is the guilt of the church in knowingly neglecting her young converts? I have known churches where young converts were totally neglected and regarded with suspicion and jealousy. Nobody went near them to strengthen or encourage or counsel them. Nothing was done to lead them to usefulness, to teach them what to do or how to do it, or to open to them a field of labor. And then, what then? Why, when they find that young converts cannot stand everything, when they find them growing cold and backward under such treatment, they just turn round and abuse them for not holding out. 4. Be tender in reproving them. When Christians find it necessary to reprove young converts, they should be exceedingly careful in their manner of doing it. Young converts should be faithfully watched over by the elder members of the church, and when they begin to lose ground or to turn aside, they should be promptly admonished and, if necessary, reproved. But to do it in a wrong manner is worse than not to do it at all. It is sometimes done in a manner which is abrupt, harsh and apparently censorious, more like scolding than like brotherly admonition. Such a manner, instead of inspiring confidence or leading to reformation, is just calculated to harden the heart of the young convert and confirm him in his wrong courses, while at the same time it closes his mind against the influence of such censorious guardians. The heart of a young convert is tender and easily grieved and sometimes a single unkind look will set him into such a state of mind as will fasten his errors upon him and make him grow worse and worse. You who are parents know how important it is when you reprove your children that they should see that you do it from the best of motives for their benefit because you wish them to be good and not because you are angry. Otherwise they will soon come to regard you as a tyrant rather than a friend. Just so with young converts. Kindness and tenderness, even in reproof, will win their confidence and attach them to you and give an influence to your brotherly instructions and counsels, so that you can mould them into finished Christians. Instead of this, if you are severe and critical in your manner, that is the way to make them think you wish to lord it over them. Many persons, under pretense of being faithful as they call it, often hurt young converts by such a severe and overbearing manner as to drive them away, or perhaps crush them into despondency and apathy. Young converts have but little experience and are easily thrown down. They are just like a child when it first begins to walk. You see it tottering along and it stumbles over a straw. You see the mother take everything out of the way when her little one is going to try to walk. Just so with young converts. The church ought to take up every stumbling block and treat converts in such a way as to make them see that if they are reproved, Christ is in it. Then they will receive it as it is meant, and it will do them good. 5. Kindly point out things that are fault in the young convert, which he does not see. 
He is but a child and knows so little about religion, so there will be many things that he needs to learn, and a great many that he ought to mend. Whatever there is that is wrong in spirit, unlovely in deportment, or uncultivated in manner that will impede his usefulness or impair his influence as a Christian, ought to be kindly pointed out and corrected. To do this in the right way, however, requires great wisdom. Christians ought to make it a subject of much prayer and reflection, that they may do it in such a way as not to do more hurt than good. If you rebuke him merely for the things that he did not see, or did not know to be improper, it will grieve and disgust him. Such instruction should be carefully timed. Often it is well to take the opportunity after you have been praying together, or after a kind conversation on religious subjects, which has been calculated to make him feel that you love him, seek his good, and earnestly desire to promote his sanctification, his usefulness, and his happiness. Then a mere hint will often do the work. Just suggest that such and such a thing in your prayer, or your conduct in so and so, did not strike me pleasantly, had you not better think of it, and perhaps you will judge it better to avoid a recurrence of it? Do it rightly and you will help him and do him good. Do it in the wrong way and you will do ten times more hurt than good. Often young converts will err through ignorance. Their judgment is unripe and they need time to think and make up an enlightened judgment on some points that at first appears to them doubtful. In such cases the older member should treat them with great kindness and forbearance should kindly instruct them and not denounce them at once for not seeing, at first, what perhaps they themselves did not understand until years after they were converted. 6. Do not speak of the faults of young converts behind their backs. This is too common among old professors, and by and by the converts hear of it, and what an influence it must exercise to destroy the confidence of young converts in their elder brethren, to grieve their hearts and discourage them, and perhaps to drive them away from the good influence of the church. 3. Some of the evils of defective instruction 1. If not fully instructed, they will never be fully grounded in right principles. If they have right fundamental principles, this will lead them to adopt a right course of conduct in all particular cases. In forming a Christian character a great deal depends on establishing those fundamental principles which are correct on all subjects. If you look at the Bible, you will see there that God teaches right principles which we can carry out in detail in right conduct. If the education of young converts is defective, either in kind or degree, you will see the result in their character all their lives. This is the philosophical result, just what might be expected and just what will always follow. It could be shown that almost all the practical errors that have prevailed in the church are the natural results of certain false dogmas which have been taught to young converts and which they have been made to swallow as the truth of God at a time when they are so ignorant as not to know any better. 2. If the instruction given to young converts is not correct and full, they will not grow in grace, but their religion will dwindle away and decay. Their course, instead of being like the path of the just, growing brighter and brighter into the perfect day, Proverbs 4.18, will grow dimmer and dimmer and finally perhaps go out in darkness. Wherever you see young converts, let their religion taper off till it comes to nothing, you may understand that it is the natural result of defective instruction. The philosophical result of teaching young converts the truth and the whole truth is that they grow stronger and stronger. Truth is the food of the mind. It is what gives the mind strength. And where religious character grows feeble, rely upon it. In nine cases out of ten, it is owing to their being neglected or falsely instructed when they were young converts. 3. They will be left in doubt, justly, as to whether they are Christians. If their early instruction is false or defective, 
there will be so much inconsistency in their lives and so little evidence of real piety that they themselves will finally doubt whether they have any. Probably they will live and die in doubt. You cannot make a little evidence go a great way. If they do not see clearly, they will not live consistently. If they do not live consistently, they can have but little evidence, and if they have not evidence, they must doubt or live in presumption. 4. If young converts are rightly instructed and trained, it will generally be seen that they will take the right side on all the great subjects that come before the church. Subjects are continually coming up before the churches, on which they have to take ground, and on many matters there is often no little difficulty in making the members take right ground. Take the subject of tracts, or missions, or Sabbath schools, or temperance for instance. What cavils and objections and resistance and opposition have been encountered from members of the churches in different places? Go through the churches, and where you find young converts have been well taught, you never find them making difficulty, or raising objections, or putting forth cavils. I do not hesitate to charge it upon pastors and older members of churches that there are so many who have to be dragged up to the right ground on all such subjects. If they had been well grounded in the principles of the gospel at the outset, when they were first converted, they would have seen the application of their principles to all these things. It is curious to see how ready young converts are to take right ground on any subject that may be proposed. See what they are willing to do for the education of ministers, for missions, moral reform, or for the slaves. If the great body of young converts from the late revivals had been well grounded in gospel principles, you would have found in them throughout the church but one heart and one soul in regard to every question of duty. Let their early education be right, and you have got a body of Christians that you can depend on if it had been general in the church. How much more strength there would have been in all her great movements for the salvation of the world. 5. If young converts are not well instructed, they will inevitably backslide. If their instruction is defective, they will probably live in such a way as to disgrace religion. The truth kept steadily before the mind of a young convert, in proper proportions, has a natural tendency to make him grow unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 if any one point is made too prominent in the instruction given, there will probably be just that disproportion in his character. If he is fully instructed on some points and not on others, you will find a corresponding defect in his life and character. If the instructions of young converts is generally defective, they will press on in their religion no farther than they are strongly propelled by the first emotions of their conversion. As soon as that is spent, they will come to a stand, and then they will decline and backslide. And ever after you will find that they will go forward only when aroused by some powerful excitement. These are your periodical Christians, who are so apt to wake up in a time of revival and bluster about as if they had the zeal of angels for a few days, and then die away as dead and cold as a northern winter. Oh, how desirable, how infinitely important it is that young converts should be so taught that their religion will not depend on impulses and excitements, but that they will go steadily onwards in the Christian course, advancing from strength to strength and giving forth a clear and safe and steady light all around. Remarks 1. The church is very guilty for her past neglect in regard to the instruction of young converts. Instead of bringing up their young converts to be working Christians, the churches have generally acted as if they did not know how to employ young converts or what use to make of them. They have acted like a mother who has a great family of daughters but knows not how to set them to work and so suffers them to grow up idle and untaught useless and despised, and to be the easy prey of every designing villain. 
If the church had only done her duty in training up young converts to work and labor for Christ, the world would have been converted long ago. But instead of this, how many churches actually oppose young converts who attempt to set themselves to work for Christ? Multitudes of old professors look with suspicion upon every movement of young converts and talk against them saying, They are too forward or they ought not to put themselves forward but wait for those who are older. There is waiting again instead of bidding young converts God speed and cheering them on. Very often they hinder them and perhaps put them down. How often have young converts been stopped from going forward and turned into rank behind a formal, lazy, inefficient church till their spirit has been crushed and their zeal extinguished so that after a few ineffectual struggles to throw off the cords they have concluded to sit down with the rest and wait. In many places young converts cannot even attempt to hold a prayer meeting by themselves without being rebuked by the pastor or by some deacon for being so forward and upbraided with spiritual pride. Oho, it is said, you are young converts, are you? And so you want to get together and call all the neighbors together to look at you because you are young converts. You had better turn preachers at once. A celebrated doctor of divinity in New England boasted at a public table of his success in keeping all his converts still. He had great difficulty, he said, for they were in a terrible fever to do something, to talk or pray or get up meetings. But by the greatest vigilance he had kept it all down and now his church was just as quiet as it was before the revival. Wonderful achievement for a minister of Jesus Christ. Was that what the blessed Saviour meant when he told Peter, Feed my lambs? 2. Young converts should be trained to labor just as carefully as young recruits in an army are trained for war. Suppose a captain in the army should get his company enlisted and then take no more pains to teach and train and discipline them than are taken by many pastors to train and lead forward their young converts. Why the enemy would laugh at such an army? Call them soldiers. Why, as to any effective service, they would not know what to do nor how to do it. And if you brought them up to the charge, how would they fare? Such an army would resemble the church that does not train her young converts. Instead of being trained to stand shoulder to shoulder in the outset, they feel no practical confidence in their leaders, no confidence in their neighbors, and no confidence in themselves. Hence they scatter at the first shock of battle. Look at the church now. Ministers are not agreed as to what shall be done, and many of them will fight against their brethren, quarreling about new measures or something. As to the members, they cannot feel confidence when they see their leaders so divided. And if they attempt to do anything, alas, what ignorance, what awkwardness, what discord, what weakness we see and what miserable work they make of it. And so it must continue until the church shall train up young converts to be intelligent, single-hearted, self-denying, working Christians. Here is an enterprise now going on in this city which I rejoice to see. I mean the tract enterprise, a blessed work, and the plan is to train up a body of devoted Christians to do what? Why, to do what all the church ought to have been trained to do long ago, to know how to pray and how to converse with people about salvation and how to act in anxious meetings and how to deal with inquirers and how to save souls. 3. The church has entirely mistaken the manner in which she is to be sanctified. The experiment has been carried on long enough of trying to sanctify the church without finding anything for the members to do. But holiness consists in obeying God and sanctification as a process means obeying Him more and more perfectly. And the way to promote it in the church is to give everyone something to do. Look at these great churches where they have 500 or 700 members and have a minister to feed them from Sabbath to Sabbath while there are so many of them together that the greater part have nothing at all to do 
and are never trained to make any direct efforts for the salvation of souls, and in that way they are expecting to be sanctified and prepared for heaven. They never will be sanctified so. That is not the way God has appointed. Jesus Christ has made his people co-workers with him in saving sinners for this very reason, because sanctification consists in doing those things which are required to promote this work. This is one reason why he has not employed angels in the work or carried it on by direct revelation of truth to the minds of men. It is because it is necessary as a means of sanctification that the church should sympathize with Christ in his feelings and his labors for the conversion of sinners. And in this way the entire church must move before the world will be converted. When the day comes that the whole body of professing Christians shall realize that they are here on earth as a body of missionaries, and when they shall live and labor accordingly, then will the day of man's redemption draw nigh. Christian, if you cannot go abroad to labor, why are you not a missionary in your own family? If you are too feeble even to leave your room, be a missionary there in your bedchamber. How many unconverted servants have you in your house? Call in your unconverted servants and your unconverted children and be a missionary to them. Think of your physician who perhaps is laying himself out to save your body. Think that you receive his kindness and never make him the greatest return in your power. It is necessary that the church should take hold of her young converts at the outset and set them to work in the right way. The hope of the church is in the young converts. 4. We see what a responsibility rests on ministers and elders and on all who have opportunity to assist in training young converts. How distressing is the picture which often forces itself upon the mind where multitudes are converted and yet so little pains are taken with young converts that in a single year you cannot tell the young converts from the rest of the church. And then we see the old church members turn round and complain of these young converts and perhaps slander them, when in truth these old professors themselves are most to blame. Oh, it is too bad. This reaction that people talk so much about after a revival, as if the reaction was the necessary effect of a revival, would never come, and young converts would never backslide as they do, if the church would be prompt and faithful in attending to their instruction. If they are truly converted, they can be made thorough and energetic Christians. And if they are not made such, Jesus Christ will require it at the hands of the church.